Yeah, you get a little blank tape, you'll be in great shape. Yeah. <laughs> There is. I haven't run into that yet, but that's just a distinctly a, <laughs> it's possi a possibility. Possibility. Uh, okay. Are you? That. Uh, now, uh, that you can see that perfectly all right, can you? I can, yeah. I can adjust the light level on it, but that's. Uh, okay. Yeah. You're getting a headshot there. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can see it clear. Yes. If I cut down the, uh, well, uh, the camera you correct for everything anyhow, so uh, the, uh, we could cut down the color level on that, but that has nothing to do with it. The camera takes care of all that. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. <laughs> well, uh, Keith, are you all set now? I'll just say a few words. Well, as I am ever going to be. Yeah. This I'll is just a new say experience. A few words and then we'll. Uh, All right. uh, I'll say, please proceed. Then you uh, start out on a, on a chronological order and just a completely relaxed manner, and we'll. Uh, uh, how far do you want the chronology to go? Just till I was born. Yeah, that's. Uh, or up that's through the just, uh, getting uh, into college, or. What? I, I think if you just start uh, with uh, giving the. Um, place where you were born, for the right. record, and uh, mm -hmm. then uh, we'll, uh, uh, and uh, any, any outstanding events in your educational career that pointed you in the direction which you eventually went might be of interest, but yes. you know, short, right. and then uh, start in on the outstanding events of the career, and so mm -hmm. forth. And the, the tape, uh, as far as the length, the, the, the tapes usually run from... Uh, uh, <clears throat> from one to two hours, and, and but that's completely flexible, with the exception of Bob Bacher, for instance. He said, well, I don't think I can talk for an hour. And I eventually had to put in another tape. It sure. went over two hours, so it worked completely flexible. Well, what about if you want a break? And, uh, <laughs> if you want a break, very say, break. yeah, and just say break, yeah, and sure. she has a pause. Thing. And uh, it, it makes a very smooth transition. Can we get you a chair, Jane? Oh, a uh, Jane? Good. That's Thank you. Uh, I yeah. can't yeah. imagine. That's a good thought. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't sit down all the time. Yeah. Well, very good. To get, well, um, today, uh, I believe, is uh, July 26th, 1984, we are privileged to uh, interview uh, Dr. Keith Glennon, who has had an outstanding uh, career in uh, science and technology in uh, many fields and has been a leader in many diverse uh, fields, as well as being an outstanding uh, uh, in the field of uh, higher education and, uh, and in foreign affairs. So with that brief introduction, uh, I would like to have uh, Dr. Glennon uh, proceed uh, uh, with his talk. And so with that, Dr. Glennon, will you please proceed? Thank you, Clarence. Well, we have to go back quite a ways now, since my wife and I had our 50th wedding anniversary just three years ago. But I can remember a little bit about what happened to me, except that I don't recall being born. I was born in Enderlin, North Dakota. My father was a train dispatcher at the head of the rails. Head of the rails meaning the railroad was being built to the west and he, we lived in a boxcar and moved with the uh, laying of the rails and he set up his office in the boxcar, of course. My uh, childhood was spent pretty much in uh, uh, Montana, first seven years, out in Three Forks, Montana, right in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And then Dad was, uh, I guess he was a night trick dispatcher there and decided he wanted to come back east and he went back to the Chicago and Northwestern and we lived in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. There, I went through uh, my uh, uh, elementary and secondary school, and I was going to be a teacher, strangely enough. Oh, yeah. What subjects were you particularly interested in? Well, I was interested in math, and I just took a lot of math, 
Uh, and unfortunately, I learned everything by rote. I didn't understand how you derived the equation or got the uh, used mathematics sensibly. I did very well. I got A's all the way through. But I, after I'd been there in, in this uh, teacher training college for about uh, six months, I suppose, I was asked to go back to my old high school and uh, do a um, substitute job. I did oh, yeah. it for three days. Now, I was a kid. What, Most, uh, what subject did you substitute at? It was in geometry, plain oh, geometry. Yeah. And I guess the, the, the problem was that uh, the kids were older than I, and they took advantage of me. And I, uh, I decided right then and there that uh, maintaining discipline in the classroom was not going to be the rest of my life work. So I said, I'm going on to college. Uh, my family, I had a sister and a brother, brother older, sister younger, and uh, nobody in the family had ever gone beyond high school. My father had gone only to, through the fourth grade. Uh, so this was a, a new uh, experience. Well, that's a very, of course, that was uh, very, very common uh, uh, back in the early part of the yes, century. Yes, a little bit unusual even to go to college. Yeah. Very unusual. I think only 10% of the age group got to college when I went there in 1924. Well, in any event, I did find a way to get uh, into college through the very great help of a friend of mine who uh, lived in Eau Claire, the son of a, a Norwegian doctor. He was at Yale as a... Uh, freshman while I was finishing my second year at uh, uh, Eau Claire State Normal School. Uh, he convinced me I should try uh, to, to, or I should send in an application. Well, I got the application back and said no. Uh, Pete went to the uh, registrar and said, uh, I think you're making a mistake, Mr. Registrar. Uh, Yale will be very good for Glennon, and Glennon will be good for Yale. Well, that did the trick. I, I received a, a letter somewhat later saying, if I could come to, <laughs> to New Haven for an interview, uh, they would r reconsider my case. Yes, as I remember at that time, at least in my experience, in order to get into Yale or Harvard, it was almost mandatory that you go to a special preparatory school. Yes, and uh, the uh, SATs were just coming in at that time. I didn't do any of that. But I went down to New Haven. <coughs> My father, I, I got a job driving uh, a lady to New York. I was at the time working in a, in a uh, clothing store in the afternoon. And she came in and said, Keith, uh, do you know where I could find somebody that could drive me to New York? And I said, well, if you just wait a minute, I'll, I'll go look. And I went upstairs to the office and I quit. And I came back and I said, I'm your man. Well, uh, we had a Cadillac 57, as I recall it, and we went across the Lincoln Trail, Lincoln Road, whatever we called it at that time and uh, stayed at the Waldorf Astoria. I remember going into New York. I'd stopped to let somebody go across the street, and a cop called out to me, Hey, farmer, run into them. They'll get out of your way. Well, I went up to New Haven and finally was accepted uh, with a condition in surveying. Sur surveying. We had a summer course in surveying. Well, I hit that for an A, and so I was there as a sophomore. They gave me credit for two years. Oh, good. I took electrical engineering because all of my family were in the railroad business, and at that particular time in history, uh, the railroads were electrifying. The New York, New Haven, and Hartford, the Pennsylvania, the Milwaukee, where we had lived out there in, in Three Forks, Montana, uh, was in the midst of an electrification uh, program. I said, I'm going to be a railroad man. I better take electrical engineering. I did. I remember I had had college physics, so-called, in this teacher's training college. And I had, I kept very fine notebooks. Oh, they were 
and they were just right up to snuff. When I went in there, uh, I went up to see the head of the physics department in uh, Chef, Sheffield Scientific School, as it was then known. Uh, he wouldn't give me credit for any of it. He said, no, you'll take uh, freshman physics here. I went to the dean, and the dean says, oh, you know those scientists, they think nothing is very important unless it has a tag science on it. We'll give you, uh, I had told him that I was interested in people. How did you get things done through other people? And I wanted to understand something about personnel administration and uh, economics and that sort of thing. And he was very understanding, Dean Warren. And so I, I was given a C in physics and I've regretted it ever since, Clarence. I don't know enough about physics to fill a, a, a thimble, and it's been a, a, a very sincere regret of mine all my life. Well, you've hidden that deficiency very well, because you've always seemed to talk authoritatively on applications yeah. of physics. Yes, well, one has to do that, you know. You have to stay away ahead of the crowd. While there, I got a job. I went there with $250 I'd saved. My first bill was $350. I decided that I'd just have to go to work, so I went out manicuring lawns and selling clothes. I got one suit. The twelfth suit that I sold was mine. I was one of the better dressed men on that campus. But uh, finally I'd a letter from a, a high school teacher of mine to a, 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 a professor, Professor Adams, who was a distinguished professor of economics at Yale. I went to see him when I finally found that I couldn't make it, and he looked at me. He was a very distinguished looking man. He finally cottoned to the fact that I was looking for a job, and he says, can you drive? And I said, well, I've driven summers for the last couple of years. All right, I'll buy a car, says he. And I said, <laughs> I was aghast. He said, well, maybe I'd better have you go out and see Mrs. Adams first. So that day, I think I took my last dollar and bought myself a pair of plus fours, which was all the rage in those days. This was 1924. Oh, yes. And uh, got on the streetcar the next day and went out and saw Mrs. Adams. But as I walked into the house, it was a modest house, uh, in the uh, entry hall there was a baby grand piano and, and there was a, a girl with a very peculiar hairdo who was the <coughs> younger daughter of the family, Ruth. And she is now my wife. Well, that's a remarkable story there. <laughs> it really is. Well, I drove for the rest of those three years uh, while I was in, in uh, college, and lived part-time with the Adams. That is, I took dinner with them every night. I had a room there if I wanted it. I got to know a good many of their friends, and I think that my time with the Adams was much more important to me. I learned more about life and how you get things done and how to behave, if you will, than I did at Yale, believe me. So uh, uh, they had a friend by the name of Wilcox, who was with Westinghouse, I believe, yes. And he'd uh, been involved in the very first days of talking motion pictures. Uh, this was in the days of Vitaphone. Uh, Warner Brothers uh, was the originator of that term. And when I was about to, to uh, graduate, I asked him if there was any chance for me to get into that. I'd had a, an offer of a job from the Pennsylvania Railroad, so I was going to make my railroad career, but I think they wanted to pay me $18 a week or something like that, and I had to pay some debts, because I was in debt when I got out of school. He gave me a, a, an opportunity to use my Easter vacation to try it out. And I went out to uh, uh, Chicago and worked uh, there for about 10 days. 
and learned something about what I was getting into and was excited by it. Of course, it's just a new business. Oh, yes. Uh, Absolutely uh, new business. About what the year was that? That was in 1927, the spring yes. of 1927. Yes, just, uh, and the first uh, talkie on Broadway had been shown on uh, August 26, 1926. Mm -hmm. Short subjects. Yes. Martinelli, I recall, and Will Hayes, who was then the... Uh, uh, director of the job that Jack Valenti now has in uh, the Motion Picture Association. Well, make skip over a little bit here because uh, it, it, I could go on for hours on this. But I did go to work for them five days after I graduated, and I was paying third, being paid $35 a week. Oh, yeah. And no overtime, nothing like that. I reported on Monday morning in New York, and at 11 o'clock I was on my way to Philadelphia. And Clarence and I got to bed at, on Friday night of that week. We worked right around the clock, maybe snatching an hour on the rug in the, in the uh, foyer or something like that. But uh, when I finally went out to dinner on uh, Friday night, I fell asleep in the soup. Oh, that's, Believe it or not. that's a remarkable story, but uh, that certainly required a concentration of effort in oh. order to get those things done. Well, this was, a, this was exciting, and I was sent all, all around this country, uh, Chicago, uh, Sacramento, and then up to Seattle, where for about six or seven months, I was uh, a service engineer. Now, I didn't know uh, a, a vacuum tube from a, a, a light bulb. At Yale in those days, in the undergraduate school, you've got no vacuum tube theory, nothing of that sort. You had to be in the graduate school. That's amazing. So uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know how to read a circuit, but I found that uh, a little practical use of a hammer and a wrench and a screwdriver you could fix most of the problems that occurred. I was shipped from uh, uh, Seattle, where, by the way, I found two of those proverbial five real friends that one finds in one's life. Two of them. And they were great friends. They're both gone now. But uh, my, what fun that was. I was a man of mystery. We locked the projection room door so that even the owner of the theater couldn't get into it. We made it so mysterious how this sound worked. Well, of course, uh, most people can't remember what a, uh, not old enough to remember what a sensation talking pictures made when they came out. It really changed uh, people's lives. Oh, uh, yes. And, uh, it's, it's a great, it was a great social phenomenon that most people take for granted now. Yes, well, on that comment, Clarence, I... I certainly felt uh, during the war when I was in this business that we were really contributing by providing entertainment at a very low cost to people who had literally nothing. They couldn't drive, they didn't have any other means of entertainment. They flocked to the theaters and it cost very little. So we felt that we were keeping the morale up anyway. Then to uh, uh, Los Angeles, where I got into the first steps of management. And about uh, six months later, I was asked to go to Europe. And I went to London in August of 1940, 1928, and was there for about uh, 19 months, during which time I learned something about my wife, Ruth Adams, and she came over, finally, for a summer course in, I think, eating chocolate and learning a little French uh, down in, in uh, Geneva. Uh, I met her at the, at the uh, boat. Didn't think about flying then, although we flew across the channel, that sort of thing. But flying the oceans wasn't being done then. And I had envisioned having her come down the gangplank, into my arms, and she came down. <laughs> very, very formal. <laughs> well, we went on from there. I came back to this country then in uh, 30, 1930 and was made uh, um, 
division superintendent uh, with a base in Washington. Was here for about uh, 12, no, about nine months. Uh, my territory ran from Baltimore down to New Orleans. I had about 700 theaters and five branch offices with about 35 men. So I was beginning to put into practice that which I had told Dean Warren I really wanted to do, get the job done through somebody else. 31, Ruth and I were married back in New, New Haven. I was then taken back to the uh, uh, New York office where I was asked to start a, uh, an educational film exchange. ERPI at that time was, uh, that was the name of the firm with which I was associated, Electrical Research Products Incorporated, a fully owned subsidiary of Western Electric Company, uh, Western Electric Company. Um, they asked me then, I, I made several changes, it was interesting, because each of them was starting something new. And that is characteristic of my life, as you'll see, uh, going on through. But they asked me to go out to um, the old Edison Studios in the brand, Bronx. Thomas Edison had, uh, had had a studio named Edison Studios in the Bronx. And I uh, became general manager of this, record, sound recording, lights, cameras, and all that. We rented the stage, provided all the equipment. The man came in with some money, we hoped, and with his uh, cast and director, and he produced the picture. I remember we did uh, a continuing newsreel there with Graham McNamee as the oh, yes. uh, announcer. Grand old man. Yeah, I should say. Well, that went on for, uh, oh, I suppose, nine months or a year. We re-equipped the studio during that time. And then, then Paramount was a, a creditor of uh, the um, of Erpie. And they had a big studio over on, on uh, Long Island, the Astoria Studios. We took those over for the bad debts. And I became uh, a vice president and general manager of that. Now, this was in 1931. I guess I was 26 years old, something like that. We made Emperor Jones there, I remember, with uh, Paul Robeson. It was a fascinating thing to be introduced to the motion pictures in that way. I was responsible for managing the studio, providing the crews, cameramen and all the rest of that, Carpenters, makeup artists, that type of thing. That, I believe that's one of the classics of all times, I have heard John Robeson. Yes, I think it is. It was a great picture. Then uh, RP asked me to go to the West Coast uh, and uh, take a look at a problem they had out there, very much like the Paramount problem. Metropolitan Studios, where the Christie comedies were made. You're old enough to remember the oh, Christie yeah. comedies. Uh, and they were in debt to uh, Erpy for quite a bit of money. Would I go out and take a look at it? And I said, well, I'm just about to go on a holiday with my wife. Well, he said, go out through the canal. So I, we took a trip through the canal, and on the way out, uh, the uh, Ballstead Act uh, was uh, canceled. Oh, yeah. So we, we were on the boat, and did we enjoy that evening when everybody was, I think, uh, well oiled before we, we landed in any event. Uh, I recommended that uh, we take it over and make a server studio out of that. And so I was then asked to go out there and be the uh, vice president general manager of that. A man by the name of Wadi Rothaker was going to be the president. He'd go out and sell the stuff, and I would... Uh, provide the, the management, uh, hiring crews, uh, really the, the, the operating part of the studio was my responsibility. From there, Clarence, I guess I was there a year and a half, perhaps, uh, 30, about that, 34, 30, no, not just about a year. And the first president of ERPI became the president of, of uh, Paramount. 
And he was out there, and he came over to see me and asked if I would come over and consult in the operations of the Paramount Studios out there. Well, in three months, I became operations manager of Paramount. That went on for about five years, the last two of which I was studio manager at Paramount. And then I was fired. Now, you don't come of age in the picture business until you're fired. Oh, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's absolutely... Uh, it's, it's sort of almost like uh, university pre presidents. They don't last very long in that business. That's right. Well, <laughs> this was all, all part of the, the business. I, I had the first engineering department in Hollywood. And uh, I wanted to, to apply what, to me, were some management techniques to the uh, uh, scheduling of, of uh, the making of a picture. Got a couple of people, to uh, directors, to go along with it. We pre-cut the picture before it was shot. That should have saved a good bit of money, and it did. We didn't have so much film to throw away. Uh, but... The, uh, I think it, that got a little bit rich for the uh, uh, general manager's blood, and he called me in one day. He said, you know, Keith, things aren't going well. I said, I know very well they're not going well. And he says, well, we'd like to have you uh, leave. And I said, I'll leave right now. I'll go get my books and get out of the office. Well, he said, we want to pay you something. Well, it, I said that I would not take the settlement. They finally paid me four months' salary. That, that, an interesting thing, I was earning at that time more than I earned for the next 16 years. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. It wasn't all that much, but it looked like an yeah. awful lot to me. We had, by that time, uh, three children. And uh, I went over to Lockheed. I had known, again through Ruth's father, uh, Bob Gross, uh, president of Lockheed, and uh, he gave me a job. Well, I didn't know anything about airplanes or how you made them or anything like that, but as I was there for about seven months, and it was strange. I lived over in, in uh, uh, Bel Air at that time. 7.30 was the uh, starting time, and I had to go about a, a mile to get there, so I really changed uh, my way of life. I lasted for about six months in that, and finally said, I, they, they don't know how to manage this thing. I don't know much about airplanes. I don't think this is a place for me. And I, I went in to see uh, Mr. Gross, and I said, I'm resigning, Bob. Uh, but in resigning, I'd like to tell you what I think is wrong at Vega. This was uh, the Vega Ventura. The, uh, was the plane that was being built at that time. We used to say that it, uh, the paperwork on it weighed more than the plane did. In any event, uh, Bob listened to me for a couple of hours, and he said, Keith, you just wait. On Thursday next, Cortland will be back. Cortland was Bob's brother and was the uh, manager, general manager, vice president, whatever it was, of the Vega subsidiary. Well, that meeting never took place. So I went in the following Saturday with my resignation to give to the general manager of the Vega plant and found they had my check ready. So <laughs> we met in the middle. <laughs> uh, I went back. I'd already been uh, asked to go to Sam Goldwyn as studio manager there. And I was there for about a year and a half until the war started. Oh, yeah. Do you remember Vern Knudsen by chance? He was an acoustician. Um, oh, the name is very familiar. Yeah. In fact, isn't there something about a Knudsen effect or? A, I would or, uh, 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 very like probably. That. In any event, he was uh, running a um, the, the the early days of the San Diego mm -hmm. Submarine Warfare Laboratory, mm -hmm. and Timothy Shea, Tim Shea, uh, with whom I'd worked at uh, Irpy was uh, uh, working with the Columbia University Division of War Research. 
under Dean Pegram, whom you did know. Oh, yes. Uh, I had a little trouble getting through to uh, Vern Newts, and I hadn't known him. But I went down to see him. And I called Tim and said, can you give me some help, Tim? I want to get into this war work I was then. This would have been 40, I'd been 35 years old. I was a little bit beyond draft age. Tim says, wait, I'm coming out next Saturday. So uh, I met him at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. He said, uh, we'll go right on, uh, Keith. I'll help you all I can here. But why don't you come back and work with me? And what's that? Well, we have the U.S. Navy Underwater Sound Laboratory in London, Connecticut. We're just starting it from scratch. Will you come back with me? I said, for sure. So by this time, you were flying across. And I went back with him on Monday, came back on Tuesday, and was at work a week later in New London, leaving Ruth to move the family back. Well, that was uh, that was, that was quite a quite a change, and that uh, and of course it was so extremely important uh, uh, with regard to minimizing the submarine losses. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, going on now, we went through the war. The laboratory was quite successful. I applied, interestingly enough, some of the uh, techniques I'd learned in Hollywood. We, we had a, uh, an exhibit room. When the admirals came in, we had uh, boards with uh, cutouts and miniatures of the various devices we were working on so we could give them a real sales talk. And uh, we designed and built what is known as the radio sonobuoy. And so far as I can remember, there were nine German submarines that uh, were killed using those sonobuoys to find them, dropping oh, yes. acoustic ordnance on them at that point. Well, three years goes by, and uh, I then uh, went to Binghamton, New York, uh, with Ansco, part of the Agfa film business, oh, yes. which was in the alien property custodian's hands, I was told we were there, it was going to be sold by the government in six months. Well, I guess it was six years later before yeah, anything like that happened. That. But I did a variety of things there. I was a head of a 400-man engineering department for a time, ran a camera plant. I never knew how to put a camera together, but I found out, and was uh, worked in the, in the film plant for a time. But... Uh, I, I was a little bit tired. I was looking for something else. And uh, we were going to have a, um, a reunion of our laboratory staff in New York. And Vannevar Bush was coming to, to uh, be the speaker of the evening. I was going to see a man by the name of Bill Snow, who had been on our staff at New London, a uh, Bell Labs, former Bell Labs man. And it turns out that he wanted me to meet somebody from Oak Ridge. Now we're getting close to the, oh, yeah. <laughs> to the nuclear business. And uh, it was uh, the head of Kellex. Kellogg? Kellex? Oh, yes. mm -hmm. uh, and we discussed the, uh, the, the job of uh, engine. Eng engineering manager or some such thing as that. I thought that was way over my head, but I, I listened. And uh, in that same two days, one of my former laboratory uh, associates from Cleveland asked me to meet him, and I met him at the Yale Club for breakfast, and he walked in and he said, Keith, how'd you like to be a college president? <laughs> I said, Chuck, I, I, I'd, I'd love it, I guess, but it isn't done that way. Come on, tell me more. Well, he was a graduate of Case. He'd been with me for three years in New London, and he had put my name in the pot out uh, when they were looking for a president, and uh, over the next few weeks or months, <clears throat> I made trips out there and had 
trustees asked me, uh, how would you go about raising money? I said, I, I, I wouldn't know. I never raised a nickel in my life. And the fine old chairman of the board, Frank Quayle, came in for one of these meetings and said, uh, what kind of speeches do you make, Mr. Glennon? And I said, I don't know. I never made one. Well, they somehow or other <laughs> finally agreed they couldn't uh, miss by very much because Case had been somewhat decimated during the war uh, with the exception of the metallurgy and the chemical engineering groups. The faculty had gone to the laboratories like the radiation laboratory and um, I remember Bob Shanklin was in charge of the acoustic measurements laboratory for CUDWR. That was a problem common to many colleges and universities yeah. after the war because they never came back. Yeah. Including myself, I was a college professor who never came back. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> well, I, uh, Ruthie and I had talked about this. She came from an academic family, of course. I had n none of that background, but there's where I say that three years essentially living with that family, Professor Adams and his wife, uh, stood me in good stead. Ruthie and I used to talk about uh, making our pile and starting a boys' school. Well, I finally didn't make the pile, but I got the boys' school, as Case at that time was a, a boy... Uh, a male-only school. Oh, yeah. I went there in 1947 in August, and then in 19... And, and I, I... I thought about what I should do. I didn't know what a faculty looked like, how they acted, what their prerogatives were, how they were organized. I thought, the thing to do is get them busy. So I went to Syracuse, saw Bill Tolley there, who had... Uh, had what he called a self-survey made at Syracuse when he went to Syracuse as president or chancellor. So I proposed this to the board out in, um, in Cleveland, and they were a little bit uh, non-committal on it, but I went ahead anyway. I thought we could get this done in maybe six weeks, or I mean six months. It took two full years. I found there... Uh, the the uh, dichotomy between the scientist and the engineer, and their absolute uh, or fairly absolute ignoring of the social sciences and uh, the softer sciences. Well, we did uh, manage to bring the engineers and scientists together. I would have a curriculum, say, in, in the metallurgy department, looked at by a man from the history department, and a man from the uh, chemistry department, and a man from the metallurgy department. We began to get them even to going to lunch together. Oh, yeah. It was, a, a, great fasc <laughs> it was a fascinating yeah. experience. Case had been uh, 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 Dayton Miller's home base, you know, and Bob Shankland... Uh, was the head of the physics department, had been a student of his and a student of Arthur Compton's out of Chicago. Uh, Bob had, had built a 30 MeV Betatron, the only one in the United States that didn't have any federal dollars in it. Oh, yeah. Well, we thought we ought to celebrate that when, it, when we uh, uh, got a beam. And I said, let's, stri let's strike out high. And I tried to get uh, Dave Lilienthal to come up and dedicate this. Oh, yes. uh, Lilienthal was busy with something else, but he sent Lewis Straws. Oh, yes. And that's where I first came to uh, know Lewis. That's very interesting. And we spent, I suppose, four or five hours together. Uh, he's a, Lewis, as you know, was a fascinating uh, set of paradoxes in some way. Uh, his, uh, but, but he was a gentleman through and through, and I don't know of anybody that was any more patriotic in his own way than, than uh, uh, Lewis. He was leaving the commission shortly thereafter, and he recommended me oh, for uh, his replacement. I remember that. 
I had taken the family out west in 1950, driven across the country, six of us by that time. And coming back, I stopped overnight, we stopped overnight in, in Indianapolis, and there was a telephone, I called in, rather, and found that there was a telephone call from the White House. Well, I said, that's peculiar, I don't know if it's the White House, but I'll call. So I called, it was a, a chap who was down at the White House for the summer, helping Donald Dawson recruit people for particular jobs uh, in the uh, administration. And I, I laughed at him. I said, <laughs> I, he wanted to know whether I would be, uh, allow my name to be uh, put in as a candidate for a commissionership in the AEC. I hardly knew what AEC meant, frankly. Let's see, what, uh, let's see what year it was. That was in 1950. It would have been uh, probably in June or July of oh, 1950. Yeah. And uh, he kept me talking, and I finally said, well, look, if, if you're serious about this, who am I to refuse to listen? So, uh, yes, I will listen. Uh, I went on home, told my uh, board something about this, talked it over with two or three other people there. I said, I don't think anything will ever come of it, but it's interesting that this uh, call came to me. And, well, it wasn't too long before Dawson called and asked me to come down on a Monday to see the president. Well, here is a little farmer boy running a an uh, institution which at that time probably had a budget of uh, $3 million all in, construction and everything else. And looking at the AEC, which uh, I learned was an, had some astronomical figures in its budget, uh, I'd never read the act, I didn't understand anything about it, but I went uh, to Washington and I saw several good friends there their names sort of escape me at the moment. Um, Quarles, Don Quarles. No, no, it wasn't Don. Don was later on. Oh, I, I just don't remember him. In any event, they all encouraged me to, to think seriously about this. And finally, uh, I had let Mr. Dawson know where I was staying. He could reach me there. He called me in. We talked about it for quite a while. And then he began giving me a lecture about patriotism, and I finally I got a little bit irked. And I said, Mr. Dawson, I don't think I need any lecture from you on patriotism. I'm running an institution known as Case Institute of Technology, and we're trying to turn it out as fine a class of patriots as you can find in this country. Well, he backed off, and I said, I'm going back to the hotel. You can get me if you want me. He said, well, wait a minute, Mr. Glennon, I think the president wants to see you. Oh. So I sat back down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I was ushered into Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Truman's office. People have asked me, what was your impression of Mr. Truman? I, I honestly couldn't have given you an impression of Mr. Truman. I was the farmer boy looking into the Oval Office, and there was the President of the United States. I, I was in complete awe, I guess, but I, at least I said, good morning, Mr. President. I didn't say good morning, Mr. Truman. <laughs> well, he had me sit down, and he talked with me very seriously for perhaps 10 minutes, telling me about the uh, work of the Atomic Energy Commission, about his great interest in the peaceful uses of it, but he uh, did not minimize the necessity for getting on with the uh, weapons work either. And then he finally said, uh, I said very little in this, I responded to questions. He said, I don't know that I'm going to offer you this post, Mr. Glennon, but I think I want to. I want you to go and see uh, Gordon Dean, the new chairman of the commission, and uh, then I will let you know, and I hope you will not keep me waiting with an answer. So I said, well, Mr. President, I'm flattered and a little dumbfounded. I don't think you could have 
found a person less qualified for this job if you'd scraped the bottom of every barrel in the room. And I'll never forget his smile as he said, Mr. Glennon, I'm not sure you're the best judge of that. That's a very, very astute <laughs> the character, Mr. Truman. You know, I went to saw Gordon Dean, liked him. I met Harry Smythe for the first time. And uh, the rest of the commission was uh, um, Sumner Pike and Tom Murray. Carol Wilson had been there as the general manager. And uh, um, oh, I called Veneva Bush to seek his uh, uh, advice on taking a post such as this. I said, Van, you know me, you know how little I know. Well, he said you did a pretty good job. I think you ought to go see Carol Wilson. Make up your mind after you talk with him because he's in the operating end and that's the fort that you will be holding more than almost anything else. So I did go to see Carol Wilson. Well, I first uh, saw Dean again and he said, well, I don't know that it's important that you see Carol Wilson. He is leaving. Oh, yeah. He had resigned. He, uh, he felt that the commissioners were getting into management too much, and he told me all about this. I went and saw him, and he told me all about this. But uh, in any event, I did decide that I couldn't refuse this uh, request. I went back home and got things straightened out back there and reported on October 1st. My first impressions included a few strange things. I suppose I was there for two weeks before any commissioner came into my office to uh, say hello or have a cup of coffee with me. Uh, I finally asked uh, General McCormick, who was then Colonel McCormick, the head of the military, military affairs, yeah. affairs uh, liaison group uh, about this, and he says, oh, I think that uh, you're just a little bit uh, uh, touchy on that. And he arranged for me to meet with a couple of the commissioners. And we had lunch together and began to get to know each other. The first question asked me by the staff was, what kind of a car do you want? I said, I don't want a car. I came down here to go to work. Well, they said, you're entitled to a car and a driver. Oh, I said, forget it. I have my own car. Well, about two months later, I was quite willing to take that car and driver because I found I was had to use the time going back and forth to uh, uh, home, reading, catching up with the, the paperwork that came across that desk. Uh, not, not to mention all of the parking time that was necessary yeah, you're you're quite right. between Congress, various yeah. offices, the military, and so on. Well, you're quite right about that. Well, then I asked um, Joe Valpi, who was our general counsel, oh, yes. if uh, I couldn't meet Dave Lilienthal. And Joe did arrange a luncheon, and I'll never forget that. We had the usual chit-chat, and uh, finally I said, Mr. Lilienthal, uh, as you know, I'm the newest and youngest commissioner there. What advice have you got for a commissioner? He said, go home. He was dedicated then to the single commissioner, uh, head of the agency, rather than to the uh, uh, five commissioners. Well, that was a shock. <laughs> I learned... I would imagine that would be a shock. I learned uh, something about it from him. I also found that I was startled. I went right into the meetings. Nobody said, don't, don't uh, uh, participate for a while, just watch. I was eager, willing to do any work that had to be done. But you may recall they had a big room where you, well, you're, oh, yeah. you were in posh quarters. Yeah. I was, was still down on Constitution <laughs> Avenue. The pushers always had nice yeah. feet. But the um, about 
30 or 40 staff members sat in that room throughout every commission meeting. And the commissioners didn't meet together to talk about what they were going to discuss. And I was just startled that that kind of thing could go on. You couldn't be quite as frank as you want to be with the staff there. You not know not how that would... Not with 30 staff, no. So I finally uh, uh, asked for a meeting of the commission and the uh, general manager. And I, I said, I just think it is wrong to go in there and be uh, uh, debating something in which there may be deep divisions, but divisions that you won't quite say what you wish you could say because you've got that staff sitting out there. Well, we finally decided that we would take Tuesday afternoons, I guess, and that we would have a commission seminar of our own, the five commissioners, uh, the general manager, and the general counsel. And I guess that uh, uh, practice was continued for a very long time. Well, it, it made a lot of difference in the commission meetings then, because we, we'd, we'd beat our heads against each other. I can remember Tom Murray calling me names in there. He wouldn't have done that in the, in the commission meeting. Uh, uh, and I think it was a, a useful exercise. We had the usual debates. Uh, what particular aspect of the commission's business would you... Uh, assigned to each man. Well, we decided you don't assign it to each man, but we began to s settle into uh, areas where we were really interested. I was interested with, along with Harry Smythe, we became very fast friends, in the operation of the laboratories. I was interested in uh, the possibility for uh, nuclear power someplace down the road. I was interested in, in uh, uh, how the organization was put together. You can see I was not the scientist. Uh, we, uh, we went on in those days. Uh, we were really in a very rapid build-up stage. Yes, uh, the, you remember, the I remember. That have been made on the thermonuclear. Uh, yes, oh yes. Build up started. And uh, K25 to K27, uh, Paducah and uh, Portsmouth. Portsmouth were all started while I happened to be there. Mm -hmm. So it was Savannah, just. Savannah River. Savannah River, yes. Oh, yes, my gracious. Uh, I got to know Walter Williams and have the greatest of respect for him. Our general manager was Marion Boyer. He was a fine person. He had come from Esso, New Jersey Standard at the time. Uh, we, uh, we didn't have that. that there, there was a, a, a new era of design for weapons. The weapons were being changed and some of them reworked. There weren't that many of them in those days. But uh, I learned something about the whole business, I guess one could say. While I was there, remembering how lost I felt and how stupid I felt in those first meetings of the commission, when Gene Zuckert came over to replace Sumner Pike, he came over from the Air Force. I didn't know Gene, but I got to know him quickly, and I suggested to Gene that he go to the commission meetings, but not take part, don't vote. It doesn't make any difference whether it's four men voting or, or, or five. Let me set up a training schedule for you. And for three months, he would go one week, uh, he'd have uh, uh, sessions with the production people in Washington. Then he'd go out and, for another week, visit all of the plants that were being built. He'd have a week with the weapons people, and then he'd go out to Rockley Flats and Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge, etc. 
And I, I think when he finally got into the real swing of it, he was better prepared than any commissioner ever had been to uh, take a, a responsible part. We went on, I, I stayed until, uh, well, there was one other fascinating experience. Oh, there are many. I got to know Edward Teller. I got to know uh, uh, Ernest Lawrence, Gene Vigner, the great names oh, yeah. in, in, the, in the business. Strangely enough, uh, almost from the beginning, I, I never could agree with Edward Teller. He was going to uh, kill every Russian and have more bombs than anybody else in the world and all that. I, I, I just couldn't buy that. We didn't have any open debates, or, but uh, it, was a, it was an interesting uh, experience to listen to Edward. He was a salesman par excellence, and of course, those great flashing eyebrows oh, of yeah. his, you know. We went through, at that time, the, um, the building of that great vacuum chamber out on Livermore. Oh, yeah. This was before the Livermore Laboratory had been started. And uh, that seemed to me to be a waste of time. Well, it turned out later to be a waste of time, except that we learned something about vacuum pumps at that time. Yes, well, that was a, that was a big, big project, but certainly. Well, there, we were worried. Prize, but there was a lot of, kind of progress made. Oh, my gracious. Uh, uh, <laughs> we were worrying about um, uh, materials, raw materials. Jesse Johnson was head of the raw material uh, division for many, many years after that, too. And uh, uh, I, but I give uh, Tom Murray credit for pushing the raw material program and for pushing the uh, big computer program, without which we wouldn't have had uh, as early a success with the uh, um, hydrogen bomb as, as we did. Tom was a, a, a very devout Catholic, went to Mass every morning before he came to the uh, uh, commission. He was not an easy person to be with, but I remember years later when I, uh, he was retiring from the commission, I wrote him a letter uh, in which I said, I, I uh, certainly give you all the credit uh, for putting us in a better position with respect to raw materials and with respect to computing power. And he wrote me back the, the nicest letter. I was, I was awfully glad I had done that. This takes us, I guess, uh, I, I've mentioned the fact that we started all this construction activity. Incidentally, you spoke of the Savannah River plant. Uh, we were going to take that site, and it occurred to me that I hadn't heard anybody describe it. So I asked about it, and sure enough, nobody had been down there. So Harry Smythe and I uh, got a plane from the Air Force and flew down there on a Sunday and at least flew over the Savannah River site so we could say, yes, it's a great site. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that was a tremendous amount of acreage. Oh, Ooh. yes. Oh, boy, I know. Well, I guess that takes me to the point where I went back to Case. Oh, yeah. and, uh, what year was that? That was in uh, November of 1952. I had told oh, yeah. Mr. Uh, Truman that I could stay for only 18 months. Oh, yeah. I was on leave from Case. <coughs> Well, I did stay 25 months, and I left the day before uh, the uh, first hydrogen explosion out in the Pacific. Oh, yeah. One of, the, one of the highlights of my entire life was a meeting at Princeton, you must have heard of, when uh, <clears throat> all of the highlights of uh, uh, the, the great men of uh, the atomic energy business, uh, Fermi, uh, Bradbury, Johnny Wheeler, Teller, Oppenheimer, the whole crowd of them were there. And uh, uh, for two days, 
we listened to debates. At that point in time, uh, it looked as though you were giving up more in the fission bomb to make one hydrogen bomb than it would be worth. But at that meeting, uh, Teller finally got the floor, and he told of a new uh, concept, which Oppie said, that's a sweet concept. It must be pursued. Now, this is in, in uh, juxtaposition to his opposition earlier on to uh, going ahead with the uh, uh, super, as they called it. Yes, well, that was uh, that was a tremendous, tremendous break, breakthrough, and of course, there has been some debate yeah. since then. You might say, who among whether it was Teller or several Sa others? Stan Ulam, Ulam was yeah. really, I think, yeah. as much uh, responsible as uh, as uh, Teller, but Teller was certainly the salesman. <coughs> In any event, uh, I'll never forget that meeting. I sat there and listened and listened. My eyes were like this, you know. Uh, and I finally uh, asked Harry Smythe as we went walked over to lunch the meaning of a term that had been used by uh, Teller, and he gave me the meaning. And Clarence, I have never used that term since, and I've never heard it used nor seen it used. It, uh, so I don't, I'm not going to tell you what it is now. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Uh, I'm sure it, it has no real uh, uh, significance as a, as a matter of, of classification now, but I still have that feeling that that's something I never thought about. I went back to Case and was there for about, let's see, 1952 to 1958, six years, when uh, Jim Killian called and said, will you come down? Uh, uh, I want to talk with you about a post, an important post, the head of the space agency. And I said, my God, Jim, I don't quite understand. I don't know anything about space. I don't know what kind of a rocket you like. Yes. But I, see, but I went by, to, by that time, of course, the, the Russians said... Uh, or Sputnik had taken it. Yes. Uh, so. Yes, I remember, uh, you recall that now, October 4th, 1957, when the Sputnik went up, and I was a member of the National Science Board at that time, and our Vanguard program was being funded through the National Science Board, and there, there were all the uh, snide remarks about this Russian accomplishment, didn't believe it and all that sort of thing, just a grapefruit up there. And I remember right, uh, calling and sending a telegram to uh, Alan Waterman saying, they can't be second in everything all the time. Send them a telegram that is fulsome and gives them the praise and the credit for having done this. They beat us to it. Why don't you, we uh, acknowledge it? Well, that's the way I, I, I viewed that kind of international uh, competition at that time. When I went down to see Jim, he gave me the, uh, the uh, law, which had been signed on July 29th of uh, 58, 57, 58. And I looked at it and read it with him, and I said, well, here's one thing that going to be troublesome right away. We had, they had the, we had to keep the military completely advised as to what we were doing. And it sounded very much like the old military liaison committee, oh, yeah. which uh, gave us a lot of trouble in the AEC. Well, I went over to see the next day with uh, Jim, Mr. Uh, Eisenhower. I'd met Mr. Eisenhower only once before, and I don't think he remembered it, but I had been called back from a vacation to head one of the Taft-Hartley panel uh, investigations okay. when the Paducah plant was going on yeah. strike. And uh, we rendered a report in two or three days. Interestingly enough, John Floberg was a member of that panel. He later became a, a, a commissioner. Surely. But uh, Mr. Eisenhower was very pleasant. Uh, 
I don't really recall very much, except that uh, I became an admirer of him. Uh, I never left his office without the feeling that I had been in the presence of a truly great man and a man that I would serve to the death. It was a, a strange feeling I had. Yeah, so he, he was a human being, rules. yes. Well, uh, the upshot was that I did go and take the job, sworn in on July 19th and went to work on August 9th and was there for 30 months. We built uh, NASA on the ashes, if you will, of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. I had said that I would not take the job unless Hugh Dryden would be my deputy. Hugh Dryden was then the head of yes. uh, and director of uh, NACA. I guess, let's and see, you, you, you were there at the time that he... Uh, <coughs> Hugh Dryden, wasn't he in Cleveland? Uh, was that one of no, the No, no, he was uh, he was in Washington. <laughs> yes, but one of the big installations was at Cleveland. Lewis, Lewis Laboratory there, yes. yes. And we had 8,000 people in NACA that fall. Three big laboratories, Langley, Ames out in Moffett Field in California, and Lewis uh, in Cleveland. We had two smaller laboratories, Wallops Island on the Virginia coast and uh, the high-speed flight station out at Edwards Field. Fine. Well, fine. Well, that's a fascinating. Uh, I was wondering if we might uh, just take a little, little break. Well, Hugh uh, was one of God's very, very fine people. He was wise. He was a fine scientist. He had a great reputation internationally as well as in this country. And I, uh, we worked together quite well. Actually, I suppose we set that up as a sort of an office of the administrator. And there was Hugh and myself. And uh, I had insisted on an associate administrator, and I, everybody accuses me of carrying over the general manager concept from the uh, commission on that, and I guess it, it probably is correct. Yeah. And it worked very well. It worked very well, and it's still there. They, only, they now have more than one uh, associate administrator. Uh, imagine, again, going from case where at that time I suppose my budget might have been seven million dollars and when, the day I was sworn in uh, Hugh took me over to meet some of the staff at the uh, Dolly Madison house which was our headquarters in those days the newest agency in town and the oldest home, house in town and they put a budget in front of me of six hundred and fifteen million dollars <laughs> quite, quite flabbergasted what do you do I said go ahead <laughs> and that, yes. I think, was pretty much the way we ran it from then on. We were conservative, yes. I found myself uh, very much in, in, in uh, tune with Mr. Eisenhower. I don't recall Mr. Eisenhower ever telling me to do any particular thing. I saw Ike, I suppose, uh, once every three weeks. I never waited more than a half a day to see him. He was very responsive. I recall one time when I was, um, I guess, a little fed up with the fact that every time you wanted to see the, the boss, there was a Andy Good Pastor or two or three others, perhaps, in there taking notes as to what we were saying. And leaving a meeting one morning, I said to... Um, Tom Stevens, the appointment secretary. Tom, does, does anybody ever see the boss alone, without the note takers? He says, why don't you try? I said, all right, set me up a date. That afternoon, I had an hour and a quarter with Mr. Eisenhower. That's by myself. Amazing story. 
And uh, I went in and I said, Mr. President, I, I, I don't want anything except the opportunity to just to chat with you. I want to tell you what I'm thinking about, what the longer range future looks like to me. I want to get some reactions, but I think you ought to know where I'm trying to head this agency. Within 15 minutes, Ike was up, stomping around that room, cursing, God damn, Clinton, we can't let these uh, monkeys get ahead of us that way. He was not one who believed in a, a race with the Russians. He wanted to be able to put up a house into space, and we had nothing that would <laughs> move more than a few pounds, you know, yeah. in those days. Uh, he was not a space cadet, nor was I. I thought that we had to uh, push as fast as we could in the white hot light of the public interest in those days, I guess still much that way, but not to the extent we had it. Uh, we had to staff, develop a program, develop relationships with the, uh, the Congress and the military, all of these things, and finish up the jobs that uh, Herb York and, and uh, ARPA had uh, undertaken before uh, NASA was brought into being. So it was, a, it was a struggle every day, and something new all the time. Good people, great people. That's one thing that I'd like to say in this uh, session. I've made speeches about the quality of the people that I worked with in uh, the government, at uh, the AEC, at NASA, and at uh, uh, the State Department. I've told industrialists, you'd be proud to have any one of those people on your staff. The fact that uh, they are labeled bureaucrats and all the rest of that is, is unfortunate, but that's what happens when you get a big organization and it gets a little bit stodgy and you get so many checks and balances that things don't get done as rapidly as you'd like to see them. Well, that's not the fault of the guy on the firing line. Yeah. Now, of course, you had the uh, opportunity uh, to be in two large, very key agencies more or less at the early stages exactly. when things were really happening and uh, essentially the heavy hand of bureaucracy had not taken you're, over in either one. You're quite right. You're quite right. And I'll always be grateful for that. Yeah. Well, we, uh, I suppose that uh, in those days uh, we might have tried six, seven shots a year, maybe get one of them that would work. It's simply because we had to use the uh, boosters or the rockets that were available. Uh, they were, for the most part, military rockets that uh, were just then being uh, designed and built. Most of them hadn't been uh, rated as uh, uh, useful in combat or anything else. But we did start a long-range program, which finally ended up with the Saturn. Oh, yes. Uh, that was, uh, I called a meeting on the 19th of December. It's strange how dates do stick in your mind. In 1958, I'd been there about three months, four months. And we invited the, uh, uh, all of the manufacturers and all of our laboratory people and the uh, services. The services uh, sort of didn't want to come, but they, they did come. We started out then to lay out the Scout, which was a little uh, pencil-thin rocket that we used for uh, uh, launches down at uh, Wallops Island, on up through the, uh, uh, the uh, Nova, so-called, which was the big 20-foot Bell rocket engine, a million and a half pounds thrust. No one had ever built one. On February 5th, I signed the contract for that, $105 million. 
uh, Rocketdyne took that on. Now that Clarence was in this, the February of 1959, and the the, the uh, rockets that used that engine, F1 engine, didn't fly for six years. That's the kind of time scale you are. And uh, I also ran into a, an, an interesting experience. A neophyte still in in government because at the commission, Gordon Dean did. He was a chairman. He did most of the testifying, uh, and we backed him up. But very seldom did I get into any uh, debates on the Hill or get really to understand how uh, the Hill and its staff worked. I had to learn that all very fast when I was the administrator. And I found it to be an, uh, an interesting experience and a very rewarding experience. My first real battle there was with Stu Symington, who I thought was a, well, I didn't have much respect for him. He had been uh, head of uh, Emerson Electric, and he, uh, when uh, my legislative liaison man, Jim Gleason, took me up there to meet him, talk with him, he gave me a lecture on management. Well, I thought I know as much about management as he did, and I, I uh, excused myself as soon as I could. But then he was chairman of a subcommittee that was trying to figure out why uh, we weren't integrating our planning with the Air Force. And I just had to say, well, you know, we just started. We don't know what we have yet. We're building an organization all that sort of thing. But I went back from that meeting, determined we were going to have a long-range plan. It took about a year. Homer Joe Stewart was the uh, man that I gave that job to. And in about a year, we had a 10-year program. And interestingly enough, with the exception of the Gemini, and of course some of the uh, uh, science shots, everything that was flown uh, up to the Apollo, up through the Apollo, was in our 10-year plan. Oh, yes. Even the configuration of Apollo, George Lowe brought in to me in 1960. He'd been up all night, he was unshaven, he didn't have a necktie on, he apologized, so I just took my necktie off and said, all right, let's just sit down. What get? And he gave uh, his conception of a three-module uh, package that would go to the moon. Hadn't decided whether it was going to be an Earth orbit or a lunar orbit, that sort of thing. Yeah, that but was those stressed to hear of his death the other day. Yes, yeah, uh, one of the finest men I ever knew. And a great future ahead of him. He's, he'd done every job he ever took. He did to perfection. The last one at Rensselaer, I don't think anybody has made as great an impact on an institution of a higher education in the five or six, seven years that he had there as George has done. It's, it's a great loss to the country. Incidentally, uh, I mentioned George. Uh, uh, did you, uh, what is your recollection of Werner von Braun <coughs> particular year? So well, now we'll back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, as I looked at our capabilities, and uh, while not, and NACA had been active in sounding rockets and some things of that sort, and the Naval Research Laboratory people that came over with us with Vanguard uh, had that kind of experience, it, it just looked to me as though we didn't have the kind of moxie in the uh, uh, space vehicle business, uh, the rocket booster business that we needed. And so in that first fall, 1958, probably two months after we'd gotten into business, I said to Hugh, I'm going to try and get Von Braun's team transferred to us. Hugh, wise man, said, I, 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 I don't know, Keith, that's going to be a, a real battle, and 
I'm not sure I would, I would try that as early as this. I said, Hugh, we must do everything we can to move this program ahead and work at the cutting edge of all the technologies, and we don't have people who understand that uh, business as much as von Braun and the people that he brought with him from Germany, and we're working with him then at ABMA, the Army Ballistic Missile Agency in Huntsville, Alabama. Well, I certainly did learn. Hugh backed me up completely. He'd had his say, I'd made the decision, he just supported me right straight through. I went over and talked with uh, Neil McElroy and with uh, uh, Roy Johnson, who was head of ARPA, and with uh, uh, 